If I were a secret agent, I wouldn't be afraid of the piranha tank. Hi, what's going on friends? My name is Brandon and welcome to Nature Meets Paper, the place where we go on an adventure to discover the world of marine biology. I love sharing my experiences with aquatic animals with you through science, stories, and art. It's my goal to raise awareness of our beautiful bodies of water and the creatures that live in them. Please stick around to the very end to hear about this month's charity opportunity. Today we will discover the warm subtropical river waters of the red-bellied piranha. Are you ready? Let's dive in! Pygocentris natureri are known as red-bellied piranhas. They are the most well-known piranha in the world. Media has portrayed them as a ferocious eating machine that can strip a carcass in seconds. So, besides living in a lair for a supervillain, where can we find the red-bellied piranha? Let's discover their geographic range and habitat preferences. Red-bellied piranhas are found in Central and South American freshwater river systems. They are most common east of the Andes in the Piranha Paraguay and Amazon basins. These rivers can be large, small, fast, or slow. I am used to clear water where I live, but the water in these places is called white water and black water. White water is not like white water rapids though. In this case, it is referring to the sediment content of the water. White water has suspended sediment in it making it brown in color and difficult to see. Black water is clear, but stained brown or dark due to tannins from plants. It's kind of like the difference between a mocha and a black tea. Piranhas shoal together near vegetation and along the coasts of the water. Shoaling is a form of schooling. Red-bellied piranhas don't tend to migrate, but will move to a location with better water quality in the dry seasons. They are diurnal, but prefer hiding in shadows. So that is how I'm going to paint this fish. I will drop down the background and give it a shadowy place to lurk from. I use a three-step process when, pa when I paint. I start with the blocking in phase, then move to modeling phase, then detail phase. In blocking in phase, I use big brushes to block in colors and tones. I work from my background to the foreground. In modeling phase, I can switch to smaller brushes and set my darks and midtones. This is also where I can add some texture. Let's move to the next segment of the adventure where I discover physical appearance and behavior. I imagine if I say piranha, the first thing that pops into your mind is the red-bellied piranha. The media has used this fish for decoration and plot points so often, it has become a staple as the bad guy's favorite fish. You probably picture a disc-shaped fish with a bright orange or red stomach, angry eyes, a huge lower jaw with sharp teeth. Red-bellied piranhas kind of look like this, but that is a fantastical description. They are disc-shaped fish, with red or orange stomachs, big fins, and big lower jaws. But their teeth aren't huge, like razor blades sticking up from their lower jaw. They're large, but they don't look like an anglerfish. They are triangular, broad teeth. They almost look like a shark tooth, wide base, and a sharp point. Red-bellied piranhas grow to be between 25 and 35 centimeters long. That is roughly 14 inches at the maximum. They do become chonky though. They can weigh up to 8.6 pounds. They are a gray blue on their dorsal surface with a large dorsal fin shifted towards the tail fin. They have a large tail fin and a large broad anal fin. They can vary in color depending on their location. It can be from a dark gray, light gray, to slate. They can have dark spots behind the gills, and their sides are covered in little silver, gold, flashy scales. This helps them blend into the shadows as light trickles down through the foliage. Their stomachs are bright red or bright orange in color. This coloration can fade as they get ready to spawn. Now, everything about their head is round. Their gill cover is round, they have large round eyes, big pouty lower lips that cover their teeth. 
It is just so round. Red-bellied piranhas live in groups of up to 25. As they grow and mature, these fish will spread out and become a little more aggressive. Their shoals are dominance-based. There will be one or two dominant fish in a group. The interesting thing is that these fish are not grouped together for pack hunting. They are together for predator avoidance. A predator will not take on a large group of piranhas. If they pack tightly together, it becomes difficult to tell where one fish starts and the other ends. It's like how zebras stand together to confuse a lion. Did you know that piranhas can make noise? They communicate with sound. There is said to be three types of sound a piranha can make, but how does this fish make sound? They don't have vocal cords. Like the toadfish, the piranha has a set of muscles that line up next to the swim bladder. Now, the swim bladder is an organ inside of the fish that is filled with gas and aids in buoyancy control. These muscles tap and move against the swim bladder and amplify the sound. So the sound comes straight from the body of the fish. They have a long, high-frequency drone sound, a low-frequency hum, and a loud, high-frequency burst. The drone sound is like a growl. The hum is when they communicate with their indoor voices, and the burst is when they ambush prey or charge, acting as a surprise war call. Who knew fish could make so many noises? Let's move to our next segment of the adventure. What do red-bellied piranhas eat and how are they doing? Unlike in media, piranhas aren't ravenous feasting machines that will eat anything that gets in their way. That was started as propaganda when President Theodore Roosevelt visited South America. He was going to go down and have a stream named after him. The local government took a section of the stream and isolated the piranhas by setting up nets and aggravating the fish. They then starved the fish so that they would go into a feeding frenzy. They warned the president not to go into the water, for there were man-eating fish in the water. They threw a sick cow into the river and it was cleaned of all of its meat in minutes. The media, being the media, blew up this story. It still does this to this day. They didn't tell the whole story and sensationalized the moment. They have the same role as sharks or vultures have. They keep the river systems relatively clean. They are opportunistic generalist omnivores. They eat insects, fish, aquatic invertebrates, nuts, berries, and seeds. They will pick off sick or dying fish and will sometimes eat carcasses that are fresh. They don't eat rotting meat. These animals are messy eaters. Think cookie monster devouring a plate of cookies. Bits and pieces go everywhere. This allows other fish to feed on the leftovers. When they actively hunt, they will lie in the shadows and wait for the prey to swim by. If they are waiting for a long time, they will snack on the vegetation that they are hiding in. Once they see a target, they rush out of the shadows with their loud burst noise and grab the prey. Since they live in places with tons of rainfall, they get to expand their territory to the land in the flood season. This is how they pick up seeds and terrestrial fruits. There has been accounts of piranhas feeding on a corpse of a human, but they don't take down large prey. How are the red-bellied piranhas doing? The IUCN Red List has them listed as not evaluated. They are probably doing fine. Aquarists don't need to take wild piranhas to introduce to their tanks. There is a healthy breeding program for that. The interesting thing that I found out while doing research was after 9 to 10 days, the eggs hatch. And they have two breeding seasons in a year. That is roughly 2,000 fish per year per female. I think they're healthy. Just be careful. I am not saying you should be carefree when dealing with piranhas. They do get feisty and might bite. Their bite is powerful and will hurt. 
Let's move to the last segment of the adventure. What was my personal encounter with the red-bellied piranha and how is my painting coming along? In this painting, I have moved on to my detail phase. This is the part where I set my highlights and use small brushes for tiny details. I don't want too many bright whites in this painting. I keep my tones muted, but bright. I want to give the sense that this fish is in a wild river that is murky. It is hidden in the vegetation and low levels of light are trickling down. I barely use any titanium white for this painting. In the places that I do, I mix it with bright colors. Just be patient with your paintings. I use several layers when I paint. I like seeing through the thin layers to add to depth in my paintings. I am also trying to figure out how to add glitter, pearlescence, or glass bead gel medium to this painting. Once I decide, I mix some pearlescent paint with some yellow to the bright flashes of silver or gold along the sides of the fish. Make sure to use your reference photo often throughout the painting. That is the best way to keep the realism. So where did I see the red belly piranha? I was at the Odyssey in Arizona. I was visiting a friend and we went to see the animals. If you know me, that's a long time of looking at animals. There was this awesome tank and several piranhas in it. I found one that I liked and I took its photo. I like waiting for the right moment so that I can show off the size of the fish for you. It gives the most detail for the reference. This fish was basically motionless, only its gills and pectoral fins were moving. I can see how the media really likes this fish. It has such a presence to it, kind of an ominous feeling to it. It looks tough and it knows it's tough. I wanted to capture that feeling in my painting. I wanted the sense of a hot, humid jungle. Underneath the gloom and murky waters lies this fish biding its time, snacking on plants, waiting to strike. The name alone strikes hesitation into the heart. The red-bellied piranha. There we have it, this painting is finished. I hope you still have all of your fingers. What do you think? I love how this turned out. I think it turned out really cool. I love the shades of green and just kind of like the mystery of the water. I'm really used to painting clear water and for me to have some kind of murky water is really fun for me. If you would like to subscribe and ring the notification bell, it would really help this community grow. I do my best to post new content every other weekend. For this month's charity opportunity, I'm going to be supporting the National MS Society. I have, so I have a few friends who have been diagnosed, and I really want to help. This year I'm participating in a five mile walk to help my good friend Shauna. It is her 20 year anniversary of being diagnosed, and we just want to raise some funds, have some fun, and go on a nice walk. I'll leave links in the description so that you can donate to you. Did you know that portions of all of my sales go towards charity? It's true. I sell the pieces of art and other merchandise to help support my community, charities, and other businesses. So if you're, if you're purchasing a piece of art or a sticker or a piece of clothing or something, anything that I produce, you're helping, you're not only helping charity, but you're helping a local business as well as this community so that I can keep going on adventures for you. If you would like to order a print, I offer two versions. I have a limited edition and a unlimited edition. I use the Feather and Fox print company on Whidbey Island as my main print shop. They are wonderful people. I highly recommend them and their business. My limited runs are as close to the original as possible. I use glitter, pearlescence, and glass bead gel medium in them to play with light in order to replicate the original. My unlimited prints don't have this. I really appreciate all of your support. Thank you for watching. Spread love, curiosity, and creativity. I've been Brandon, and I will see you in our next adventure.